Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, there's a common misconception out there that you can't do action on a budget, and if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you're in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals and pick their brain about uh, current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, influences, and so very much more in a light and conversational fashion. And if you like how we do things around here, I'm assuming that you do, uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. You can find us over at Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, basically anywhere where you get your podcasts. And uh, if you can also give us a like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, at our In the Seeds YouTube channel, excuse me, uh, where we uh, archive all of our episodes, that'd be great too. Plus, you can follow us on the social media, as the kids call it. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at either at In the Seats or at its podcast one for all sorts of fun updates. And finally, and I say this a lot, but it's true, it is the most important thing. Please pay us a visit over at In the Seats, in the seats.ca for all the latest and greatest uh, movie news, reviews, basically from all across the world, video on demand, festivals. Uh, we love talking about cinema, and we love it when you come and uh, read about it when we write about it. So please stop on by. On this episode, though, as I teased at the beginning, we're getting into a little bit of action. Uh, we're talking an action movie, a new action movie, which is on VOD platforms, and now it is called Overrun. Uh, and it's, uh, well, it's a... Uh, it's really an ode to things like John Wick and Reservoir Dogs and Smoking Aces, but it, it's done on a it's done on an indie budget, let's say. It's done on a bit of a shoestring budget, but here's the thing. Uh, the movie still looks pretty damn good. Uh, and it stars uh, Omid Zader and uh, Johnny Messner and uh, the likes of Nicholas Turturro and Bruce Dern. And it's, it's a fun... A uh, fun little action flick, and we had the distinct pleasure of sitting down and talking with filmmaker Josh Tessier, as well as his star Omid Zader about the making of the film and uh, their origins in the in the stunt business and influences, and uh, so very much more. But uh, go give Overrun a chance on your favorite VOD platform and uh, enjoy our talk with uh, Josh Tessier and Omid Zader right now. All right. Well, I mean, first off, obviously, thank you for the time today, guys. Really appreciate it. And I mean, I got a kick out of the movie. Just, I guess, Josh, my first question is for you. Uh, walk me through the origins of the story and just sort of uh, going on this uh, this uh, this run, this adventure. Well, first off, David, I'm glad that you like the uh, the movie. It always makes me feel good when someone enjoys it. Um, so we did a short back in 2012 called Raw Brute, and um, you know, the original idea for this movie was not supposed to be as tongue in cheek as it ended up being. It was supposed to be very heavy and serious. Pretty much everybody dies. And it was more about PTSD. You know, my brother was in the armed forces. So like we kind of, it was originally called a good way to hell. And I realized halfway through, it's just, it was going to be too big, you know, for our budget and for the time that we had. So we revisited um, Root and kind of morph that story because it had some comedy and it had, I mean, the short we did was not comedic at all, but you know, the movie itself had some funny bits. And so we did that, which you saw what, what is completed. So it's kind of what we, uh, we did. And then the journey, you know, began from there. Fantastic, man. And I mean, something else about the film, which at least really worked for me is just that you're not fucking around with the stunts. Like you're actually doing stuff. It's, you know, yep. it's not like it's a far cut away. Can you talk to me just about, I guess, finding Omid and just uh, making this a real action movie where you can sort of feel the bones crunching and the hits hitting? Because, I mean, a lot of times, especially in budget action movies, it'll either sort of cut away and try to do too much or it won't do enough. This seemed to be just the right balance. Well, I appreciate that. That Really, I, I do. That was a goal of ours. You know, oh, oh, and I've been friends for a long time now. We're, you know, he's like my brother. And uh, we come from a stunt background. So I, I, you know, as a filmmaker, you know, when you're not working with a lot, I always say, you know, there's three sides of lenses, right? There's like the small lens, the medium lens, and the big lens. And if you try to film a small movie on a big lens, it's just going to feel, it's going to feel short. It's yeah. going to feel like you're doing too much. So we decided to put it on the small lens and fill that frame instead and, you know, get that. And since we come from the background, we know what we can and cannot do on whatever said budget. 
So we're all, we're both very cool people. Like I, you know, I love when you can actually feel it. You know, there's no, I have no ill will, ill will feelings towards the big Marvel movies or anything like that. But, you know, I think there's something to be said when it's there and, you know, CGI and all that is um, it's not to take over what's actually going on. So like, I, I personally love, you know, just the real, feel of like a punch feels like a punch you know when you're feeling something like that and we wanted to show as much as we could there because at least we know uh, the budget constraints don't affect fights when you have guys who can actually fight and you can film them actually doing their things so i think it's really important to to show that so um i hope that answered your your question no it, it did man i mean i guess this is my, my next question is for you amid uh how was it for you to sort of step into something like this i mean especially working with your buddy but also knowing that you're the lead you're, you're carrying it you're not playing you know kidnapper number two or security guy number one <laughs> <laughs> that's been my life for for a long time so uh you're not you're not far off but enchanted tree number four yeah um so yeah man it's uh it, listen i definitely have my doubts you know there were there were uh days before we started shooting where you know, I had little mini panic attacks. I was like, oh my God, am I going to be able to do this? Like, did I, did I bite more than I can chew? And, um, but, but at the end of the day, I would always think about the team behind Josh and I that, you know, cause we were, we produced it together as well. And we only had 15 days to shoot the entire film. And that's why you see the action that you see. Everything has um, a purpose. It's not just about mindless action of let's just blow something up uh, because we had limited resources and time. We had to make sure that um, we get everything in the time constraint that we had. So all the action that you see um, is is for a purpose. Um, but for me, you know, the, the action and the fighting, that was, to be honest, the, I don't want to say the easy part, but it was the easier part um, because that's just my bread and butter and it's Josh's as well as far as uh, direct and stuff like that. But it was, uh, you know, it was the all the other things in between and then us, again, producing as well, and uh, me, and then, you know, Josh being behind camera the whole time, but whenever I wasn't in front of camera, I was playing producer. So it was always this this balance of trying to go back and forth. Um, but, it, you know, I definitely have my doubts. That's for, that's for damn sure. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're really proud of the product that we made and we have, and um, we hope that, you know, the general audience will watch it and, and, and be entertained by it. And that's our goal at the end of the day. Now, I'm curious from both your perspectives, what is it about, uh, because, you know, I mean, I've talked to stunt people before, and stunt people always seem to have the best sort of sense of scale and the sense of sort of cinema. Like, why do you think it's the stunt guys who really have much more of a sense of how a movie, how a film will look, as opposed to sort of maybe the visual effects guys or somebody in in another department who wants to write and direct their own film it always feels like the stunt guys have the proper sense of scale when they're, when they're trying to make their own stuff well i mean I'll, I'll go first i think that for stunt people you're on the ground man like you're you're there and if you've done a gamut of things because like both of us have done you know small budget medium budget big budget um but like when you're there and you're part of like you're the troops you know, so it's like you're seeing how it's done and you're doing usually most of the big set pieces on these movies. So when you're a part of that and you can bring it to yourself, you know, if you have a foresight and if you have any kind of filmmaker, you know, background, because it's like for both of us, we we studied another things, you know, we own a post house, we do all this. So that just helped. But as a stunt person, I feel that it's all about timing and it's all about looking at what you're doing and how you're doing it. And when you're the one that's doing all these set pieces and you're part of it, all you have to do is stop and observe how these other people do, how like these big, big dogs are, are doing it and they're seeing it. And you can just put it to yourself personally, you know? And I feel like it helps um, being on the ground as uh, doing the mechanics of all this stuff. So therefore you can do some of these bigger things smaller but still make them feel big because you're just doing it you know you're part of the again you're part of the the trenches you're in the trenches usually some people because most some people i don't want to say we're overlooked but we kind of are there's not an academy award for stunts there's not you know really anything like that but you know our department usually is a, a big asset to most films and it, it's we're like the forgotten the, the forgotten people right for, for most of it, there's some others that, that are as well. But when you look at it like that, 
you can just learn and look because you're overlooked, right? So you just kind of are part of this whole system and this this whole, you know, ideal of making films and stuff like this. So I think that it really helps because you're doing so much. Like even as a stunt coordinator, you know, you're really an integral part. So you're learning from the best, from Antoine Foucault, from Clint Eastwood, from all these guys that you're working with. You're literally three steps down and you're not really seen or heard, but you're watching and you're still in that respective position of putting this stuff together. So therefore, I think that you we have a, uh, a leg up because we're doing, uh, I don't want to say more so than a director or a writer because you know they do a lot of stuff, but we're the ones putting all these big set pieces together. And when you can figure out how to do that and how to do it well, then from that point, you are doing the hard stuff. So it's just making sure the story makes sense, making sure everything else goes with that, that kind of um, uh, thing. For sure. And I mean, it's one of those things because, and I mean, this kind of just dawned into my head that your department, you know, working in stunts, you're the one department on a film that's not trying necessarily to overextend itself because if you overextend yourself, you get hurt. You get hurt. Yeah. And that's yeah. just, that's the nature of your business. So, you know, to sort of stay within the confines of your box and sort of make it the best you can within the limitations that you have. Like, you can't necessarily on this film, you know, recreate something that, you know, you did on The Mandalorian or NCIS or something like that because it's, it's you know it's tomato tomato it's it's like it's two different worlds entirely i agree and 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 josh going back to what josh was saying josh and i have always been the guys that don't necessarily like sitting in our trailers we're always on set trying to learn um about new equipment new lingo you know there's always something to be learned on set um so we're students um of filmmaking and and that what that's what really helped us i feel like move along into our next natural progression in Hollywood, uh, which is for him to direct and for me to act and us to produce together. And it, it really helps having done jobs, you know, I've been a PA um, and none of these jobs that I'm about to say, I am a pro at, I respect them, um, but I've done grip work, I've done electric, just basics and basics of, of things on small indies. And we've really, we've really, got an appreciation for the hard work that each department has to go through you know everywhere from art department to costumes to construction we know we know we have a general sense of how hard it is and what it takes to get to where we need to get to and I feel like that really helped us as filmmakers ourselves because having an idea of what every department's going through and what their needs are is really important um, to be good producers and good filmmakers in general and you know I like that because it's not a question of you know, you're sitting around waiting for someone to set up the next shot. You're wrapping right. cable. You're picking up the camera. You're physically going to the next shot, and you're doing it yourself. Absolutely, absolutely. Now I'm curious. During the whole process, was there was there any moment where either of you felt maybe in over your heads? Um, no, I, I think that we've prepared for this moment. I'm a huge cinephile, and I don't want to sound you know egotistical saying that, but I think that we've been building this. We did a lot of prep and what we could do you know, like I was saying on the small lens to make it feel big. Uh, was it tough? Oh, of course. But we're both up for the challenge. I think that, you know, every now and then when Bruce was there, like it was one of those things I'm really directing Bruce Dern. You know, it's like, this is a thing. I wouldn't say overwhelmed, but it was just one of those, those moments where we're like, wow, this is a thing. This is cool. You know, this is my first one as the first unit guy. And um, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was great. I, I don't want to say, yeah, I don't want to say that we were getting overwhelmed. I mean, Omed, I think that maybe he thought, could he do this or could he do that? But I don't think at any point it was overwhelming. You know, this last film that I did, that was overwhelming, but and it, for, a very, for very different reasons. And I wasn't directing it. But, the, but this one, we took a lot of care and making sure everybody felt comfortable. So therefore, when everybody else feels comfortable, I feel comfortable and Omid feels comfortable. So therefore, we don't get overwhelmed because it's, you know, we're trying to do something in, in a minimal amount of days. So the more, the more comfortable everybody is, the better it is and the more comfortable everybody is. So I, I for me, I, I didn't really feel overwhelmed. It was an undertaking um, and it was a lot, but I don't think that we were quite, we were, there was some moments that we got close, but I don't think that I ever once felt overwhelmed per se. No. Yeah. Same here. It was just, it was more a matter of this is what we need to do. This is our current obstacle. How do we overcome that obstacle? Because again, as filmmakers, especially Josh, as a director, um, even if you do feel moments where you're like, damn, I don't know what I'm gonna do. You know, he's the type of guy that will not show it on his face nor verbally because he knows that on set, he's the director, he's the leader of the set. 
and therefore, and everyone respects him on set because we kept the crew and cast very happy. Um, you know, we had decent hours, really good food. Um, and so to, to get that hierarchy of set of, well, if the top of the pyramid's doing okay and they're not panicking, then we're doing okay. And so it all comes down to that. And, you know, we may have only had 15 days to shoot the film, but we had about six weeks of prep. Um, and it, that obviously really helped, but prep is everything, you know, especially with these budgets that you don't have millions for, and you don't have, you know, what I call FU money of like, oh, there's a problem. Here's, here's money, go fix it. We don't have that luxury. So you really have to be on your toes as far as the prep of it. And that, that's what I feel like some filmmakers make the mistake of not fully thinking everything through, especially on the indie, indie level. Well, they don't yeah. I, I agree. And I'll, uh, I'll continue that is because most first time, first time directors have not been on set. They've just come from school or they're just very creative guys that have never been on a proper set. But the two of us have been doing it for a long time and have seen the gamut of sets. So it's therefore, again, you know, you know what to do, what not to do, how, how to do it, you know, the best of your knowledge. And uh, it, again, like, like Omid said, if, if you can go in there with, even if you make the wrong choice, as long as you're committed, people will follow you into the to fire. And if you're cool with the fire, they're going to be cool with the fire. But if you're not cool with the fire, then everybody's, it's just going to implode. And then you're going to have overtime and it's just going to be thing because you don't know. You know what I mean? I think it's really important to, uh, to have all that. No, it's a good lesson too, because I mean, obviously, you know, you know, in before in prep, you've got all the time in the world. As soon as cameras start rolling, you don't have any time anymore. You're you're working, right, right. And believe That's us, it. we definitely had moments learning lesson, uh, learning moments where we learned a lesson. And but that's the thing. At the end of the day, until you're in the trenches and doing it, those lessons are going to be those those quote unquote mistakes are some of the best things that you can learn from. And so we learned quite a bit on this one. Um, just uh, just doing everything from A to Z, and that really helped us. You know, it's uh, it's those learning lessons that are really important on set. Excellent. Now, I mean, just to start putting a bow on this, and this is a bit of a silly question, but it's always something I like to ask. For both of you, can you think back to sort of your younger days and like, what were the movies or even a movie or a TV show that made you want to get into this business, be it stunts or acting or what or whatever? You go ahead, Omid. I'll, I'll answer mine after you. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I, th I still think it's a great classic. Uh, Bloodsport was one of the first films that oh, I right. remember seeing over and over again, because I just, I love the fighting aspect of it. I love the story. Um, and that was, that was something that, you know, I, uh, I was born in Iran. So I was watching this uh, before I even fully spoke English, but it was just one of those films that I really enjoyed watching. Um, and that, that really inspired me. Um, I remember, um, I don't remember what the film was, but I remember I was maybe around eight or nine years old and my aunt and I were watching a film and she said, oh, that's a, that's a stunt double. And I was like, what's a stunt double? And she said, oh, they do the things that actors, uh, the scary stuff is what she said, that actors don't wanna do or they can't do. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. So that was, that was the other first like influential moment as far as wanting to get into the business um, was that, but just honestly, I'm a big Scorsese fan. So any, any Scorsese fan, uh, any Scorsese film um, that you can name of, I've, it's inspired me in some way or other. Um, I love any Guy Ritchie film, obviously Spielberg, uh, Fincher, nice. um, any Christopher Nolan film, like Inception was such a grand thing for me to, and I, I've watched that movie over and over again, the Dark Knight series, I mean, there are so many films that I can name that have influenced me. For me, um, I like all those as well. But for me, I was in a history class and my old uh, football coach was also the history teacher. And he put on a movie by David Lean called uh, Bridge on the River Kwai. And I remember when the bridge fell and all that fun stuff, I just was so amazed. It's such a great film. I love that film and it, it meant a lot to me. So I think that was like me, the, the first film where I was like, man, this, this would be really cool, like looking into it of like what to do and how to do. And then ob and obviously, you know, John Carpenter, 1982's The Thing was a big, you know, in Sam Raimi's Evil Dead, they're all like DIY movies. You know, The Thing, not so much, but Evil Dead was. And yeah. um, it, it just, cause I was a big Grindhouse guy and a big, you know, horror movie fan. And I just love the innovative, the, the, all the innovativeness that uh, Sam did and even Peter Jackson's Bad Taste and, you know, Dead Alive, his first couple of movies. And, you know, Steven Spielberg's Duel, 
really, uh, you know, before he got Jaws. And, you know, that really, that really like showed me that it can be done at a low, but like low cost, because, you know, when I was younger, I didn't really know how much this cost, but I just really enjoyed, you know, for sure, John Carpenter, because like he didn't have a lot of money for most of his films, but like he didn't care. He just made what he did and he knew what it was. And, and a lot of his movies actually didn't do well when they came out, but they're revered, revered now. And I don't know, I just, those were really influ- influential to me, you know, uh, the old John Carpenter and, you know, David Lean's, I mean, obviously that was a big movie back in the day, but it's just, um, it spoke volumes to me as a filmmaker. Right. And uh, I, uh, I really enjoyed those kind of things because they're doing, you know, even like uh, George Romero and, and Tom Savini, and they're doing their stuff on the, on the Day of the Dead movies. It's just, are they the best films now that they hold up? Not as well as they used to, but if you ask me, 1982's The Thing still holds up. It's terrifying totally. as hell. Totally. So, And that movie, it still, <laughs> it still scares me. Well, sure. yeah, it, and, and they knew how to do tension. And I think in an action movie, you know, you have all the great action movies like Hard Boiled and, you know, it's the old school John Woo stuff, Police Story, that really inspired me as well. But, you know, they're doing and Jackie Chan with all of his stuff that he did back in the day in the 90s and the 80s and all that fun stuff. But it's like you look at like how all these people were able to build tension. And as a filmmaker or as a storyteller, because I was a, I, I wanted to be a journalist before I was ever in film. I just watched how they built tension and what they did and how they did it. And, you know, why I kept saying horror movies, you know, the thing and stuff, just because tension in the thing is you know catch and release right that's how you make a good film and that really inspired me to want to be a filmmaker and to do those type of things to affect people for entertainment or for scares or for laughs or you know for any of kind of that stuff but that really wanted me like spurred me into the direction of filmmaking well you know what and i mean i'm so glad that you brought up just sort of the necessity for practicality especially with a lot of the filmmakers you just listed because I mean, my my one of my biggest pet peeves, like especially with an indie production, is like if they're trying to do an action scene, then they run out of money, and then there's some sort of horrible cheap digital effect that just takes you out of the moment entirely. And you guys did not do that to your credit. You understood how to build tension and how to how to make this the right way and show people that you can make a, an independent action film. And I think you guys have done a good job. And I just want to say thank you both for the time today. Yeah, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate it. Thank you for that compliment. Yeah. Did you like the movie? I We're at the end of the interview. You could you could tell me if you hated it. That's okay. No, 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 no. I didn't. <laughs> I genuinely dug the movie. No, no. And I mean, like I said, I appreciated the fact that it was, it wasn't trying to slap on any sort of cheap digital effects. It was doing it all the right way, and it made it allowed me to enjoy it more. Oh, good man. Good. I'm I'm glad that was the case. You know, um, our special effects guy Frank, um, is I've known him since Prison Break. And we've been friends for a long, almost, geez, since 2007. God, it's such a long time now. Um, We've just been working together. And and he came out and helped us out with some of the explosions and the gunfire and all that fun stuff. And and again, with CGI, I think that it's there as a tool to enhance, not to take over. So if if it's not there to enhance, then I don't think you should use it. Obviously, we're not a space movie. So, you know, you're in space, you have to use computer animation. But if you're down on Earth, you know, as much practical as you can, because people aren't stupid. Audiences aren't stupid. And as good as as good as CGI is nowadays, it's still not quite there. It'll be there eventually. But yeah. I feel like there's something to be said of living and breathing the moments. And I will live that until I no longer filmmake, which hopefully is until I'm 90 or 100. Josh, I mean, man, keep up the good work. Keep doing the good David, work. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Your time brother. Yep. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and and Blu-ray needs.